Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Being an overnight chaplain, I spend a good bit of time watching and observing. And one of the more interesting places to watch and observe is the trauma bay. The trauma bay. Now, this is not a picture of the trauma bay where I work. This is one I found online, but it pretty accurately represents what you would find in a, in a trauma bay as far as equipment and people and what the people are wearing and things of that nature. But don't get me wrong. I do more than watch and observe in the trauma bay. See, as the chaplain, our role is to be the first people that meet the family members who come in with the patient. Or if the patient is brought in and the family has to be contacted, it's our job to call the family and let them know their loved one has been brought into the hospital. But even with that role, I still spend a good bit of time watching and observing. And the observing usually starts before the patient arrives, as the various people who will be involved come to the trauma bed. Naturally, the incoming patient's situation dictates who will be in the room and the preparation taking place. And sometimes I can tell when I walk in the door that what's going on is pretty serious. And it's during these serious situations when the attending physician may do a roll call of sorts, checking with the residents and the nurses and the other staff to make sure that each anticipated task is assigned. They may ask if there's blood available and if certain supplies are out at the ready. I can feel the energy in the room and I sense the adrenaline is flowing through everyone waiting for that patient to arrive. Then the doors open and the medics wheel in the patient. They take the few steps over to bed and begin the process of transferring the patient from the litter to the bed. Normally, patients are already connected to IVs and maybe hooked up to oxygen. So as well as transferring the patient, the IV fluids and the oxygen tubes and everything else have to be transferred over. But sometimes, well, not sometimes, all the time, something else is happening that is very important. You see, the medics who bring in the patient have been treating that patient since they first encountered them. They have been taking vital signs, administering medications, splinting broken bones, bandaging wounds, whatever the case may be. So when they first arrive with the patient, one of the medics will give a report. The report will include information the team needs for their work. It may include a description of what happened, a medical history or allergy information, or what medications the patient is taking, if they know that. The information may be used to determine the course of treatment, the testing that may be done, and maybe even help with a diagnosis. But sometimes in situations like that, the adrenaline is working real hard. And as soon as a patient is transferred to the bed, the team begins their work, calling out instructions, calling out results of the survey of the patient. At the same time, the medic is trying to give their report. Now, if the medic is the male, the attending physician may call out, he's giving his report, listen to him. So this morning, we took a leap did you feel it? We took a leap. We leaped all the way from the opening chapter of Act 1 of Mark's Gospel to the opening chapter of Act 2 of Mark's Gospel. This morning, we heard the text commonly referred to as the Transfiguration. It's the text we read from the different synoptic Gospels each year on the Sunday before, as we transition from the season of Epiphany, when we remember the manifestation of Jesus, to the season of Lent, when we prepare ourselves for the events of Holy Week. So today is kind of a transition. It's a bridge between Epiphany and Lent. It also represents a transition in Mark's Gospel. You see, in Mark's Gospel, up until now, 
Jesus has been walking around Galilee teaching, healing, and feeding the multitudes. Jesus, while he was in Galilee, sent out the twelve two by two and was pleased when they came back to share their results. But despite all this teaching that Jesus has done, despite all the miracles that have taken place, and despite the results of those trips out two by two that the disciples took, Mark tells us that the disciples were still struggling to grasp what's going on and who this Jesus guy really is. So in chapter 9 now, we begin the second half of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is going to come down off that mountain and begin the journey to Jerusalem that will lead up another mountain and a cross and ultimately resurrection. But our lectionary people made it clear today that in order to really understand what's going on, we need to look back. The first three words of that gospel text that Dave read were six days later. So I bit, six days later than what? So I went back and read chapter one, or not chapter one, verse one. The first word in verse 1 of chapter 9 is and. Now, when I went to school back in the day, it was beaten into my head. You don't start a sentence with the word and. Becky Joe, do we still teach that? No. Ah! <laughs> so... Okay, so we can start with and if it's for emphasis. So somehow, Mark knew that. <laughs> Mark was ahead of his time. Okay. Because I kept blaming Mark, saying, Mark, didn't you get the memo? <laughs> so the chapter begins with and, which means we need to look back to the previous chapter. So as we begin Act 2, we, we have to do one of those in the last episode things. Like, you know, when I was a kid and Batman was on two nights a week, the second night always started with a recap of what happened the first night so you understood why the Cape Crusaders were in whatever predicament they were in. And we almost have to do that here. We have to go back and look at chapter 8. A quick recap. So let's go back to chapter 8. Jesus and the disciples are walking between villages. And Jesus decides to make small talk. Now imagine making small talk with Jesus. So he asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. And then he says, okay, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. Now according to Mark, Jesus sternly warns them not to tell anyone about him. But you know, I have to believe inside, Jesus is doing the happy dance. They finally get it. They figured it out. Well, that didn't last long. Jesus then tells them that they're going to have to undergo great suffering, and he's going to have to be killed, and three days he will rise again. And Peter pulls him aside and rebukes him. So the same guy that just had Jesus doing the happy dance, Jesus walks up to him and says, get behind me, Satan. So poor Peter. He went from giving Jesus the happy dance to being called Satan in the matter of two verses. Then Jesus tells them what it means to be a follower. He says, deny yourself and follow me. So now we get to those opening words of chapter 9. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days go by, and then Jesus goes up the mountain, and he takes the big three with him, Peter, James, and John. Or as my old pastor Lou Hornberger used to say, Pete, Jim, and Jack. We know the story. Jesus is transfigured. 
The Greek word is metamorpho, similar to our word metamorphosis. So this was a complete transformation, like the caterpillar into the butterfly. And then Jesus, or Peter, sees all this going on, and he says, boy, it's a good thing you brought us. We can build tents for you three guys. I love how Peter says that. But then the next verse is, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. So here's my wondering about that verse. They did not know what to say, for they were terrified. See, scholars, some scholars believe that one of Mark's sources for his gospel was Peter. So is this verse Peter's confession? That I blurted it out because I had to say something. Or was it Mark's editorial comment about what Peter had said? But I have to tell you, I get Peter. How many of us, be honest now, have been involved in a situation either we said to ourselves or someone said to us, don't just stand there, do something. I'm the only one? Okay. How many of us are the type of person who has to do something? You know, one of the hardest things for me to learn as a chaplain is that sometimes the best thing I can do is nothing? I have stood with families at a bedside and not uttered a word. And when it was time for us to go, they thanked me. It's a hard lesson for some of us to learn that sometimes the best thing you can do is nothing. But let's not sell Peter short. Let's give Peter a little benefit of the doubt here, just for a minute. About a week before this, Peter heard Jesus say that some will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Next thing you know, he's on the mountain with Jesus, and Jesus is transfigured, and Moses and Elijah are with him. And I still ask the same question I asked last year. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? So maybe the kingdom of God has come, and that whole being killed and rising from the dead thing doesn't have to happen. I can see Peter thinking that. You know, let's have the festival of booze because the prophet Zechariah said that God would raise in the new age and bring in the new age during the festival of booze. So Peter's like, wow, we can avoid that whole dying and being raised from the dead thing. We got it right here. Let's, let's build these tents, these tents. That, then we'll have the festival of booze. It's done. Then the cloud appeared. And the voice in the cloud said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Everything is back to normal. And it's just the four of them on the mountain. The words the disciples heard were very similar to the words we heard at Jesus' baptism back in chapter 1. But remember... We had an advantage over Peter, James, and John. They were 70 miles away in Galilee when Jesus was baptized. They didn't hear those words. And Mark tells us that even if they were there, they still would not have heard those words because Mark tells us that only Jesus heard those words God spoke at the baptism and only Jesus saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove. So now here on the mountain... God is telling Peter, James, and John that Jesus is God's son. God is telling them to listen to Jesus. God is telling them what Jesus said about being killed and rising, listen to him. God is telling them what Jesus said about what it means to be a disciple, listen to him. God is telling them what Jesus is going to teach you after you, after you descend from the mountain, listen to him. What Jesus is going to teach you as you journey to Jerusalem, listen to him. When the trauma team pauses to listen to the medic's report, they receive information that can help them care for the patients. 
When the disciples listen to Jesus, they hear instructions on living the life of discipleship and a message of hope that despite what is going on and what things appear to be, everything is going according to plan. When the disciples listened to Jesus, they were given the lessons they needed to take Jesus' message all over the world. What started with that small group in rundown Galilee is now a church of billions of people all over the world. What about us? What does it mean for us to listen to Jesus? Not just hear, but to listen. Igor Stravinsky said, to listen is an effort, and just to hear has no merit. A duck hears also. I'm not sure why he picked the duck, but if this is true of music, how much more does it bear on Jesus' commands? It's one thing to admire Jesus, but what a challenge it is to follow his instructions. These are some of the things Jesus says in Mark's gospel. Follow me. Pay attention to what you hear. Do not be afraid, only believe. You give them something to eat. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. And friends, that's only Mark's gospel. There's plenty more in Matthew, Luke, and John. So as we transition from the season of Epiphany to the season of Lent, how are we going to listen to Jesus? What is Jesus calling us to do in Pocono Pines, Monroe County, our state, the nation, and throughout the world? As we listen to Jesus, are we willing to respond? Are we ready to answer Jesus' call and follow Jesus? I think we can all agree that answering Jesus' call can be challenging and can immerse us in realities we would rather avoid. But as Clifton Black reminds us, anyone who thinks the Christian faith is a retreat from reality is clueless. We know that. We know that there is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. It's a cost we accept because we are following the instructions God gave to Peter, James, and John on that mountain. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Amen.